it's now time for us to turn our attention towards one of the most important topics in JavaScript, which is the concept of objects. In its simplest form, an object can be considered to be a collection of key and value pairs. However, the reason why it is important in JavaScript is because pretty much everything we work with can be considered an object of some form. These include strings, functions, and many, many more. For this demo, we will stick with the pattern followed so far in this learning path of creating an HTML file along with a linked JavaScript. So this is the object creation.html, which is linked to object creation.js. Switching over to that, we enable strict mode, and then we define our first object. I had mentioned that an object is in fact a collection of key and value pairs, and these are defined in JavaScript within parentheses. So for each key and value pair, the key and value are separated by a colon, and the key value pairs themselves are separated by commas. An object can be used to represent pretty much anything you want, and in this case, let it represent a product, which we will call first item. So the different fields which we have for this first item include a key called ID and its corresponding value is 1. So this product has an ID of 1. The second key is called name and it has a corresponding value of laptop. And then the third key is called price whose value is 500. So this represents an item whose ID is 1, which has a name of laptop and which costs $500. In other programming languages, structures which are similar to JavaScript objects can be referred to as associative arrays or even dictionaries. You could also think of a JavaScript object as a collection of properties where there is a property name and a corresponding value. So now that we have a JavaScript object, let's see how we can access the different values which are defined within it. So in this console.log statement, we access the value of the name property as first item dot name and the price is accessed as first item dot price. So a combination of the object name and a key will give us the corresponding value. To test it out, I'm going to bring up the browser and open up the HTML first and then we'll bring up the dev tools and then view the console where the value of laptop and 500 to show up for the item's name and price. So we have now successfully created a JavaScript object and access its properties. Heading back to the source, we will now initialize a second object, which is a second item. And this one has a different number of key and value pairs when compared to the previous one. So there is a new brand field whose value is the string sonical. We will now take a look at another notation which can be used in order to access the values in an object. So rather than the dot notation, we can use the syntax of an associative array where we specify the key within square brackets and then this will return the corresponding value. So we will now access the name and price for the second item using this notation. And heading over to the browser, we can confirm that the value of watch and the price of 240 have been returned as expected. So we have seen in our examples that both of the items have a different number of fields, that is a different number of key and value pairs. So if it's not exactly clear whether a particular object has a given field, what if we try to access it? For example, there is no property called brand within our first item object, but we will try to print out its value right here. But when we access second item dot brand, we expect the value of sonical to show up. So we head over to the browser and we can see that first item dot brand is in fact undefined. So this is what we get when we try to access the value of an object's property which does not exist. Heading back to our source, I'm just going to comment out all of these statements which we have so far. And then we will take a look at some other object related properties. First, I'm going to define a constant value, which represents 
the US dollar to euros exchange rate. At the time of this recording, it's approximately 0.9. That is, 0.9 euros gives you 1 US dollar. The reason we have this is because we are now going to introduce a third item for which we will have a regular price property which represents the US dollar price and then we will also have a price EUR property which will represent the price in euros. So these pair of Sonical headphones cost 84 US dollars. However, in order to get the euro price, we are not going to hard code the value but we are going to derive this using the US dollar price along with the prevailing exchange rate which is available from our USD underscore EUR constant. Now since we are trying to derive a particular property's value using one of the existing properties, we will need to refer to an object's own property. And the way to do this in JavaScript is to make use of the this keyword. This refers to the current object. And to get the value of price for the current object, we can access it as this.price. So from outside the object definition, we can access the value of the price field using the object name dot price. However, within the object, we need to make use of the this keyword. However, will this reference to another field within the same object work? Well, there is just one way to find out. So we include this console.log statement where we will access the euro price as third item dot price EUR. And heading over to the browser, when we hit refresh, what we end up with is a NAN value. Note that this is not because that this keyword is not meant to be used. And if we head back over to our object, the cause of our error is that calculating this euro price does in fact involve an operation. And for this, we cannot have the value of this property just set to an expression, but in fact needs to be a function. So we will now redefine our third item and this time price EUR is not an expression but in fact maps to a function. Note the syntax of our function definition here. We use the keyword function and since it doesn't accept any arguments we leave the parentheses after that empty and in this occasion we make use of curly braces which includes the function body and within the body we have just one line where we return this dot price multiplied by USD underscore EUR. So does this change to our object work? Well, there is just one way to find out. So this time in our console.log statement, we will in fact be invoking the function price EUR rather than simply accessing the property. Since functions in JavaScript are first class objects, they can also be the values within objects. So we head over to the browser now and then hit refresh and this time the euro price is calculated correctly as about 75.6. So we have now seen how we can have functions be the values within our objects. Heading back to the source, I'm now going to make a slight alteration within our third item. So I'm going to redefine this but I'm now going to make use of the ES6 syntax in order to define a function. So we do away with the colon which we had previously and we also do away with the function keyword. We just have the name of our function which is price EUR followed by parentheses and then the function body. And then following that I'll have one more console.log statement where we invoke this newly redefined third items price EUR function. And then we head over to the browser to test it out. And a newly defined price EUR function with the concise ES6 syntax also gives us the correct euro value. In the previous video, we created a few JavaScript objects and we saw how we can access the values of the various fields within an object. Now, what if we wanted to modify an object after it has been initialized? So for example, we have this object third item which currently contains an ID, a name, a brand and a price. So let's just say we wanted to add 
a new property to it. Well, we can do this again using the dot notation. And here we set a value of Canada to a new property which has the name manufacturing country. To confirm that this new field does get added to the third item object, we will print out the entire object to the console. And when we head over to the browser and hit refresh, the object does show up in the console, but not all the fields are visible. So I'm just going to expand this. And we can clearly see that the third field now is the manufacturing country. All the fields which appear here are in fact in alphabetical order, starting with the brand, then the ID and so on. It is also possible for us to expand the function here. So we can see that price UR does not have any arguments. And the function location is, in my case at least, on line 40 of object creation.js. It is possible for us to expand each of these fields in order to view their values, but we will leave that for now. I'm just going to minimize this function. And it's time now for us to head back to the source code. Before we proceed though, I'm just going to comment out everything here. And now we only have strict mode enabled in this code, but I'll go ahead and declare a fourth item. But this time, I'm going to make use of a different notation. So fourth item is being initialized as a new object for which we make use of the new keyword followed by the object constructor. At this point, this fourth item object won't really have any properties, but we have already seen that we can use the dot notation in order to add properties to an already existing object. And that is precisely what we will do by adding the properties of ID, name and price for this fourth item. We will then proceed to print out the entire object to the console. So let's see exactly what this looks like. Heading over to the browser and hitting refresh, we can see that this fourth item is indeed printed out and it does have the three different properties which we had set with an ID of four, a name of cell phone and a price of 450. So we have seen different ways in which we can add properties once an object has been created. However, what if we wanted to remove a property from an existing object? Well, heading back to the source, we will see that this can be done by making use of the delete keyword. Say we wanted to get rid of the price field, we just do delete fourth item dot price. And to see what this newly updated object looks like, we will once again have a console.log statement. And when we head over to the browser and refresh, we observe that the updated fourth item after the price field has been deleted has just two fields, the ID and the name. As a sanity check, I'm just going to expand this fourth item. And yes, this object only has two fields at the moment. So now that you have been introduced to the concept of JavaScript objects, we will continue playing around with it in order to examine its various features. In the next video, we will take a more in-depth look at the this keyword when used within an object. In the previous video, we were introduced to the this keyword when used with an object. We saw that it can be used in order to reference an object's own property from inside an object. In this demo, we will take a look at the this keyword in further depth and see exactly what it refers to in various contexts. So once again, I have an HTML and JS file defined and the HTML is merely a placeholder here. So let us move over to the JavaScript and after enabling strict mode and after that, we check whether this refers to the global window object when used in a global context, that is, it is not inside an object or a function. So to test it out, I'm now going to switch over to the browser and bring up the HTML file. And then upon bringing up the console, we see that this is in fact the same as the window object. To confirm it, we will just examine the this object itself and heading over to the console, we can see that this points to the window object and the entire window object 
is now accessible from the console. So heading back to the source, we will now initialize a variable called age and set it to a value of 35. One thing we haven't covered in this learning path so far is that variables when declared in this manner are in fact properties of the window object. We can reference this variable as window.age and since this equals the window object, we should also be able to access its value using this.age. To confirm, we head over to the browser and refresh. And it becomes clear that the age variable belongs to the window object and that we can also reference it using the this keyword. Heading back over to our source now, let's see what happens if we try to modify this.age. What is the value of window.age in this case? And what if we try to access the value of the age variable directly? Well, heading over to the console, we can see that both of those have also been updated to the value of 55. So window.age, this.age, as well as age are all pointing to the same value. So we now have a clear idea that in the global context, this points to the window object. Heading over now to the source, let's see what happens if we try to return this from inside a function. So I have defined an arrow function called sum function which accepts no arguments and it simply returns the value of this. So what is the this object in this case? Well, we will have a console.log statement to confirm this by invoking sum function. And even in this context, this returns the window object. Arrow functions in JavaScript inherit the scope from their parent, which is why the value of this points to the same window object in this case. Moving back to the source, I'm just going to comment out all of the code we have here, except for the use of strict mode. And we will take a closer look at the use of this inside an object. So the object I'm going to define here is called my car, which contains at least three of these fields representing the make, model, and price. And then it includes a print details function. Within the body of this function, I'm just going to have a console.log statement, which returns what this refers to inside this object function. And to view exactly what this refers to in this context, I will invoke the print details function using the mycar object. And when we head over to the browser and refresh, we see that it is the mycar object itself which is returned. So when defined within a function inside an object, this points to the object itself. We already had an idea of this from the previous demo. So heading back to our source, let us make this print details function a little more meaningful and get this to actually print out the details of the car object. So we will print out the make, model and price and we will access the values from within the object using the this keyword. And before invoking this function, I will just have a console.log statement to denote the fact that the details of my car are being printed out. All right. When we head over to the browser and refresh, we can see that my car in this case is a Volvo S60, which costs $42,000. All right. So now it's clear exactly what the scope of this is inside the object. But let us add a little more complexity. We will now modify our object to include one more property, that of an engine. However, the value of engine is going to be an object on its own. Within this engine object, we include a few fields such as the number of cylinders, the displacement of the engine, as well as the horsepower which it generates. And then inside this engine object, we have one more print detail function, which prints out the details of this Volvo S60 engine, specifically the displacement and the horsepower. Note here that we once again make use of the this keyword, but what exactly will this refer to in this context? If it refers to the engine object, then the correct values of displacement and horsepower will be accessed and printed out. However, if it refers to 
the my car object, then the values will be undefined. You'll also observe that the two print details functions we have here, both within my car and then within the engine object, have the exact same name. Alright, so let's see how we can invoke each of these separately. So we already have an invocation of my car dot print details. And to invoke the engine's print details function, we can simply call my car dot engine dot print details. And we will now need to head over to the browser to view exactly what this refers to in each case. And from the output, it is clear that in the case of my car's engine details, this refers to the my car object. And inside the engine's print details, it refers to the engine object. Heading back over to our source code, we observe that the definition of this my car object is rather large, especially with the inclusion of the two print details functions. Now it is possible that we may have not just a single my car object, but several objects which have the same fields. For example, instead of just my car, there could be several car objects which have the same fields like make, model, price, as well as engine details. However, it doesn't make sense to have print details functions defined separately for each of them. Things could be made easy for us if you were able to define the functions outside of an object and then bind them to specific objects when they are being invoked. We will see exactly how that can be done. But first, I'm just going to comment out everything we have so far. And then following that, I will redefine the my car object. This time though, it does not include any of the functions. So the definition is a lot more concise. In the next video, we will define the functions in order to print the car details as well as the engine details outside of this object. And we will invoke those functions by linking them to this my car object. In the previous video, we saw how we can have a function definition inside of an object and how the this keyword within those functions will reference that object itself. We will now take a look at how we can separate the function definitions from the object and still have the this keyword reference a particular object by explicitly linking the object to the function call. So we started off with this concise object definition. And now it is outside of the car object where we define the print car details function. So note that I've changed the name from print details to print car details and we'll later have a similar function called print engine details. Now inside the print car details function, we have the same body as we did previously. So once again, we make use of the this keyword in order to reference the make, model and price of a car. However, given that this function is defined outside, of the object, we will need to link this function to a specific object when invoking it. So similar to the print car details function, there is the print engine details. And I'll go ahead and paste the body, which is once again identical to what we had previously. Even this function will need to be linked to a specific object when invoked. So how exactly can we perform this linking of a function to an object? Well, there are three different methods which we will explore in this demo. The first of these is using the call function. I had mentioned earlier that pretty much everything in JavaScript can be considered an object. And this also applies to functions. And we can use the print car details function or object to invoke the call method. So when we invoke print car details, what do we want this to refer to? Well, that is the argument to the call function. And in this case, we get it to reference the my car object. So when this dot make, this dot model, and this dot price are referenced within print car details, they will be pointing to my car. To test it out, we head over to the browser and I'm going to refresh the page. And the car details are printed out exactly as before. So we have now successfully separated the object definition from the function and we have linked a function to a specific object. We will now go ahead and perform a similar linking using the call function for the print engine details. And once again, the argument is 
the object we want print engine details to link to. Specifically, we would like this inside print engine details to reference the object mycar.engine. We now head over to the browser to test this out. And the car details remain that of the Volvo S60 and the engine details give us the displacement and the horsepower of the engine object. So the outputs of these print functions are identical to what we had previously when we had included function definitions within the object. So what exactly is the benefit of this approach? Well, it means that if we have another object, let's just say one called your car, which has pretty much the same fields, it is possible for us to reuse those same functions and then link them with this new your car object. So for example, if you wanted to print out the details of your car, all we need to do is to invoke print car details using call and then link it with your car. In fact, we will do the same operation with the print engine details where we will link it with your car dot engine. So we have not redefined the functions for your car. We simply reuse the already existing definitions. So the call method defines what exactly this will refer to within the scope of the function calls. So to test these out, let us head over to the browser and refresh. And we can see that the same function definitions can be used in order to print the car details for both my car as well as the your car objects. One thing you will have noticed is that both the my car as well as your car objects have almost identical fields. When this is the case, it often helps if you have the ability to define a blueprint for an object and new instances of an object can be created out of that blueprint. Well, in JavaScript, we have object constructors which serve this purpose and that is what we will examine in the next video. The goal of this demo is to cover the role of object constructors which effectively serve as blueprints for the creation of objects. In many ways, these are similar to classes in other programming languages. And we will now examine how we can create an object constructor for a car object and then use it to create new instances of cars. So once again, we have an HTML for this, which points to objectconstructors.js. And heading over to this JS file, we start off by defining an object constructor function. So this serves as the blueprint for a car. And we define all of the common fields for car objects, such as the make, model, price, and engine within this function. Note the use of the function keyword, and then the name of this function is car with a capital C. So this is just a convention and is not a requirement when it comes to object constructors. And if you do have prior experience with object-oriented languages such as Java, for example, then you can think of this as the constructor function within a class. The arguments to this function are the values of the fields in order to construct a new car object. So this includes a make, a model, and a price, and also an engine. And in our example, the first two of these arguments will be strings, the price will be a number, whereas engine is going to be another object. So how exactly can we create a new object out of this? Well, to create a new car object, we will need to define an engine object. So let us define it right here. This is an S60 engine representing a Volvo S60. This in turn has three different attributes which we include here. And then following that, we make use of the new keyword in order to create a new instance of car. So this is where we specify the four different arguments to our object constructor, the make, the model, the price, and the engine. This will create a new object out of the details which we have just supplied. And that object has the variable name, my car. So just to confirm that the object has been created as expected, we will print out the make and model from the my car object over to the console. So let us now do just that. Bringing up the browser and loading the HTML, I'll just go ahead and bring up the console. And the make 
and the model have been correctly printed out as Volvo S60. So we have now successfully created our first object constructor and have also initialized our first object using that. However, the purpose of having an object constructor is that we can reuse that function in order to initialize multiple objects. To demonstrate that, we head back to the source and in addition to the already created Volvo S60, we'll create an object representing the fancier car, which is the Porsche Cayman. We start off by defining its engine and then we will use that in order to create a new object. And once again, we make use of the new keyword in order to construct the your car object. So the fields for this include Porsche 718 Cayman and the price of 61,000 along with the engine. And we will print out the details of this car to the console as well. So we have now successfully created two objects representing the Volvo S60 and the Porsche Cayman using the same object constructor. These constructors effectively function as a blueprint in order to create new objects. But there is more to object constructors than what we have just seen. The two objects we have created only have fields, but no functions defined within them. So let us now redefine our object constructor. So it has the four different fields as it did before, but we also include a function called details. So this will print out the details of the car, which include its make, model, and its price. And we should be able to invoke it from our newly created objects. To start off, we reinitialize my car, which is once again a Volvo S60. But this time it includes this details function, which we will invoke to confirm that the details are printed out as expected. And what we see is that the information about the make, model, and the price are correctly printed out. So we have now successfully included a function definition within our object constructor. In fact, we can go ahead and include one more function within its definition. So this will print out the details of the engine. And this function is also called details. However, we define it within the engine object of a car, which is why there is no conflict. To confirm that behavior, however, we will invoke mycar.engine.details as well. And we head over to the console to test it out. And sure enough, the details of the car as well as the engine have been printed out. So our object constructor contains the definitions for the common fields as well as the functions for the car objects. And for those of you familiar with classes in other programming languages, you'll observe that this behavior is similar to that of classes. Given that many people who get started with JavaScript have previously worked with Python, Java, or C++, and are used to classes in general, JavaScript has included the class keyword. And just like with the other languages, you can use this in order to create a template or a blueprint for the creation of objects. An important thing to keep in mind when defining classes in JavaScript is that is not an entirely new feature. In fact, it is just syntactic sugar around the function constructors we have just played with. But let us see how exactly classes can be defined. So here we use the class keyword and then we will create a new class called vehicle. Now within this vehicle class, we will have a separate constructor function. And you'll observe that this seems very similar to the function constructor we just used. It accepts the make, model, price and engine for a vehicle and then assigns them as fields within the object. However, this constructor function should be called constructor. Beyond that, we can also include function definitions within our class. So here we include a detail function and this definition is identical to the one we had previously within our car object constructor. For now though, we will include just this function within our class and we will create a new object out of this class definition. Once again, we make use of the new keyword and then we create a new vehicle, which represents this Volvo S60. You'll observe that syntactically, 
creating a new object out of the vehicle class is identical to creating such an object from a car function constructor. So just to confirm that the details are printed out, we will invoke my cars details function. And with this test, we can see that once again, the details of the Volvo S60 are printed out as expected. So we now know how to define the blueprint for the creation of objects using both function constructors as well as classes. Effectively, they boil down to the same thing since classes in JavaScript are merely syntactic constructs around function constructors. Just a little later in this learning path, however, we will see how classes can be used in order to implement inheritance in JavaScript. We now come to the rather important topic of working with object copies in JavaScript. We have previously seen that it is possible for us to create copies of arrays, which can be either shallow copies, where you effectively have two different variables pointing to the same underlying data, or you can have deep copies, where two variables are entirely independent of each other. The same also applies to objects, which we will now explore in this demo. So heading over from this object copying.html over to the JavaScript, which it points to, I'll just go ahead and initialize a my car object. So this includes a make, model, price, and a color field, along with a field called seats, whose value is an object. And we will just print out the value of my car to the console. So loading the HTML and then bringing up the console, we can see exactly what this my car object looks like. All right, so we have one object to work with. And the point of this demo is to create copies from this object. So here we can see that this includes the four fields, which we defined at first, whose values are strings or numbers, and then seats, which itself is an object. This nested object of seats is in fact important in this demo because we will demonstrate how fields which happen to be nested objects behave differently compared to the other fields when creating object copies. You will also observe that both the my car object as well as the seats object within it have a proto field whose value is object. Proto here references a prototype which we will get to a little later on in this learning path. And it's not quite important for us to understand this for this demo. However, it is now time for us to create a copy of this object. So we head back to the source. And now we create a variable called your car, which is going to be equal to my car. So if we do this and say that your car is my car, are we referring to the same car here? Well, to confirm that, we will first print out the entire your car object. And then we head over to the console. And it's clear that both of these have the exact same values. So we have successfully created a copy of an object using the equal to sign or the assignment operator. Just to confirm the contents of your car, we can see that even the nested seat objects has the same fields as my car. However, in order to fully understand whether it is a shallow copy, we will need to modify some of the fields in your car. First of all, we add a field at the top level to the your car object, specifically tires. So this is not something which is present in my car. But following that, we modify the fields in the nested object. So we set your car .seats color to gray, whereas this is brown in the case of my car. Following that, we will print out the contents of your car to the console. And just to avoid some potential confusion, I will comment out the previous console.log statements here. So we can now head over to the browser and confirm that our modifications to your car have taken place. So that is the only object which gets printed out. And we need to expand it where we can confirm that the tires field has been added to your car and has a value of Pirelli. And in the nested seat objects, the color has now been set to gray. 
All right, so we have successfully modified this object. But the question is whether this modification has modified the original my car object from which we created this copy. So we print out that object to the console now. And when we refresh, we can see here that my car is now available here. And when we expand it, what we observe is that the tires field has been added to this object as well. So the modification to your car has affected my car, which is also seen in the value of the seats object, where the color has now been updated to gray from the original brown. So we clearly have created a shallow copy of the my car object in your car. And this is something to keep in mind when assigning objects using the equal to sign in JavaScript. The effect is to merely create a different variable pointing to the same underlying data. All right, we will now explore one more way of creating an object copy and we'll explore whether it is a shallow or a deep one which is created. But before that, I'll just comment out this console.log statement which prints out your car. So we will now initialize a variable called his car by invoking an object method. Specifically, this is the object.assign function, which effectively copies over the fields from a source object over to a target. You can almost think of it as being used to merge two objects together. So the source object in this case is my car, which is the second argument, and the target is the empty object, which is the first argument. Object.assign works by copying over all of the fields from the source argument into the target and then returns the target. So when making this function call, his car will be a new object which contains all of the fields in my car. And then following that, we will modify the color attribute of his car and we will also change the seat color to a rather loud neon green. And then we will print out both of these objects to the console and then see whether this assignment using the assign method has created a shallow or a deep copy. Again, just to avoid any confusion, I will comment out the previous console.log statement. And heading over to the browser, both of these objects are now printed out. And it's now time for us to see the value of the fields in each of them. So his car has certainly been created from the fields of my car and the two changes which we made to this object have taken effect. The top level color is red and then within the seats object, the color is neon green. We do however need to confirm the values of these fields in the my car object. So I'll just go ahead and expand that. And what we observe is that at the top level, the car color is still gray. So in spite of the change to his car, this value has not been modified in the original my car object. On the other hand, in the nested seat object, that color has now changed to neon green. So when copying objects using the object.assign method, we have not created an entirely independent deep copy. All of the top level fields in both of these objects are independent. However, in the case of nested objects, both my car and its copy, his car, are pointing to the same underlying object. However, creating copies using object.assign is different from creating a copy using the assignment or equal to operator, since at least the fields which are not nested objects are independent of each other. So far, we have seen that the equal to sign can be used in order to create a shallow copy of an object. And we can create a slightly less shallow copy by making use of the object.assign method. It is now time for us to explore one more way of creating object copies, and this is by means of the spread syntax. So to demonstrate that, we can head over to our code and just comment out these console.log messages. And now we will initialize one more object called her car, and this is going to be a copy of my car and see exactly the syntax which is used in order to generate this copy. We make use of the three dots 
in order to spread out the contents of my car. And this is defined within curly braces so that the contents of my car are spread out inside a new object. So when we create this her car object in this manner, let us confirm that it does indeed create a new copy. And from the console, we can see that this is also a Volvo S60. And then expanding it shows us that all of the fields are identical to the original my car object. Even the nested seats object has been copied over here. All right, it's now time for us to test out whether this is a shallow copy or a deep one. So heading back to our code, we can now modify the color field within the seats object and we'll set this to a value of black. If her car is in fact a completely independent deep copy, then the value of this field in my car will remain neon green. So the only way to test it out is to print out each of these objects to the console. And when we go ahead and hit refresh in the browser, let us expand each of these objects first. Her car now has an updated value for the seat color, which is now black. And when we expand this in my car, this is also black. So clearly, my car and her car are not completely independent. So the use of the spread syntax in order to create a copy of an object does not create a deep copy. However, this copy is similar to using the object.assign method, where all of the fields defined at the top level are indeed different copies. However, in the case of nested objects, they are in fact references to the same underlying data. So the question now is, how exactly can we create a deep copy? where even nested objects are created out of copies rather than references. Well, we will need to make use of the json.stringify method for that. And to demonstrate its use, we head back to the source code and first comment out the console.log messages. And now I'm going to redefine the mycar object so that the values are back to what they were at the beginning of the demo, where the color of the car is gray, and the seats are brown leather. We can now redefine the your car object, and this will be a copy of my car, but we will use a combination of the json.stringify and the json.parse methods in order to generate this copy. So when we invoke json.stringify on my car, this effectively converts that object into a string representation. An important feature here is that even the nested objects are converted to strings. However, this is of type string and not an object. So in order to create a new object out of that string, we can invoke json.parse. So this will be a brand new object initialized out of a string, and this will be completely independent of my car. We can in fact test it out by adding a new tires field to your car, and the seats in your car will be rather colorful since you're going to change the color to purple. All right, when we print out each of these objects, you should expect that my car will neither have a tires field nor will its seat color change to purple. It should retain the original brown. These changes should have taken effect in your car, however. So we test it out by heading over to the browser. And first, let us expand the your car object. And sure enough, this does contain a tires field whose value is Pirelli. And the change in the seat color to purple is also evident. All of the other fields though, are exactly as they were in the my car object. So this has clearly been created out of a copy of my car. However, to check whether it is in fact a deep copy, we will now expand the my car object. And what we observe is that the tires field has not been added to this. And importantly, even the nested object, which is the seat, has retained the original brown color. One important point to note about using this combination of json.stringify and json.parse is that you cannot use these in order to create copies of objects where the attribute values are functions. This is because functions are not recognized by the JSON format and those will be lost 
if you json.stringify an object. Now that we have performed many different operations using objects in JavaScript, we will now explore some of the built-in methods which are available for objects. Once again, we have an HTML and JavaScript file, and then this HTML points to objectmethods.js. Heading over to that, we start off by defining a mycar object, which is similar to what we have been working with previously. And then following that, we will create a new copy of my car. Let's just say this belongs to someone called Sam. So this is Sam's car. And this is created by invoking the object.create method on my car. In effect, this will create a new object called Sam's car using my car as a prototype. Now, prototype is a topic we will cover a little later on. But for now, you can assume that the Sam's car object will get all of the fields and functions which are defined within my car. What we will be checking though is whether this copy which will be created is a deep one. If it is, then the modification of the nested seats object where we set the color to white will not affect my car. To test that however, we will print out both of these objects to the console. All right, it's now time for us to carry out the test. So I'll open up the browser, load the HTML, and then bring up the console. So we can expand Sam's car. And what we observe is that it includes a prototype. And when we expand the prototype, we see all of the fields for my car. So all of these values for color, make, model, and price can be accessed using the dot operator. And we can in fact do the same for the nested seats object as well. In fact, within that object, we can see that the change in color to white has taken effect. However, it's time for us to test out whether that color change has affected the original my car object. So I'm just going to minimize this one and expand my car. And what we see here is that the seat color has been updated. So clearly, both my car as well as the Sam's car objects are pointing to the same seats object. On the other hand, I can tell you that modifying any of the top level attributes in Sam's car will not affect my car. This is something we will explore a little further when we study prototypes in this learning path. For now though, we will examine some of the other built-in methods for JavaScript objects. So I'll just minimize this and then head back to the source. And before proceeding, let us comment out these console.log messages. With that done, we will now invoke one more function available within object, and this is object.keys. Since any object definition in JavaScript is essentially a collection of key and value pairs, we can invoke the object.keys method on an object to return all of its keys. So, what exactly are the keys in my car? We can print these out to the console. And when we head over to the browser, all of the different keys are printed out within an array. So there are a total of five different keys for my car. We can expand this in order to view each of the different keys. So you see here that what we have are five different strings. Since we can get all of the keys in the form of an array, we can also do the same with regards to the values in an object. So we will now print out the values of my car by invoking object.values. And from the browser, we observe that once again, an array of five different elements is returned, but the types for each of these elements corresponds to the types for each of the values in our object. So for example, the first two values here are strings, then the price value is a number, and the value at index 4 corresponding to the seats is an object. So we can invoke object.keys in order to retrieve all of the keys for an object in the form of an array of strings. Object.values returns all of the values. And we will now invoke object.entries on my car in order to return all of the key and value pairs in our object in the form of an array of arrays. To see exactly what this looks like, we head over to the browser 
and then refresh the page. And you can see that corresponding to the five key and value pairs, we have five different elements within the array. And each of these elements is an array itself of two elements. The first element in each case happens to be the key. And the second element is the value. Expanding the first of these arrays, we see that the first value and the second value here happen to be strings. The value at index 2 corresponds to the price field where the key is a string and the value is a number. And expanding the last of these arrays, we see that the value here is essentially a copy of the seats object. All right. So now that we know how to extract the keys and values of an object in JavaScript, we can head back to the source. And then before proceeding, we comment out all of the new console.log messages. And we follow this up by defining an engine object, which we can add into my car. What we want is for this engine to be merged into the my car object. And the way to do that is to invoke object.assign. We have already seen how we can essentially create a copy of an object using assign. But what this method actually does is merge two objects together. In this invocation, the target object is my car and the source object is the second argument to assign, where we define a new engine attribute whose value is the S60 engine. So in this case, object or assign will return a copy of my car with the engine field added to it. And this will become the variable your car. We will observe by printing both of these objects out to the console that they are exactly the same. So we can confirm that by heading over to the browser. So both your car and my car are printed out. And by expanding your car, we can see here that it contains all of the fields contained originally in my car and also the newly added engine field. Now moving along to the my car object, we observe that the engine field appears here as well. So what is clear now is that object.assign merges the contents of the source object into the target object. And since our target object happened to be my car, it has been modified as a result. We will now continue exploring other methods available for objects in JavaScript. And the next one we will take a look at is meant to prevent the inadvertent modification of an object. So we head over to the source and then comment out these console.log messages. And the specific method I'm referring to is called object.freeze. When we invoke this method on my car, it essentially returns the same object, except that the object is now frozen. We'll just reference this object using a different variable called her car. And we will observe that when we try to modify the top level color attribute of this object, this is not permitted by JavaScript. However, it should be possible for us to change the values of nested objects. Let me reiterate though, that in this case, my car and her car are two variables pointing to the same object. All right, to test out whether the object does get frozen, we can now refresh the page and we immediately get an error, specifically on line number 50, where we try to modify the top level color attribute of the object. So this is something which is clearly not permitted when we freeze the object. So what happens if you were to head back to the source and then comment out this line of code? Well, we do that and then we save down the file and then heading over to the browser. When we refresh, there is no error here. So modifying the nested object within our my car object is permitted even after the object is frozen. We will soon print out the object to ensure that this change has taken effect. Before we do that though, we head back to the source and this time we will try to add new attributes, both to the top level object where we add in a new tires field and also to the nested object where we add in a bucket field to the seats object. So while we cannot modify top level fields, 
Is it possible to add new fields to a frozen object? Well, we head over to the browser and this is something which is clearly not possible. The message does tell us that our frozen object is not extensible. So we are unable to add this new property tires. So I'll just go ahead and comment out the line where that change is made. But we will now check whether it is possible to add new attributes to the nested object. So heading over to the browser, this time when we refresh the page, there are no errors. The lack of errors does not necessarily mean that our nested object has changed. So we will now print out both the her car and my car objects to the console. And there are a couple of things which we do need to look out for. Firstly, whether the color attribute in the nested seats object has been modified to red and also whether the addition of the new attribute to seats, that is the bucket field, has been performed. Beyond that, we also need to confirm that both my car and her car are in fact the same object. So we head over to the browser now. And now that both of these objects have been printed out, let us expand her car. And specifically within the nested seats object, we can see that the color has been modified to red and the bucket field, signifying whether these are bucket seats, has also been included. So the freezing of the object has not prevented us from modifying or even adding new fields to nested objects. All the fields at the top level though are clearly frozen. And now it's time for us to check whether my car is in fact pointing to the same object as her car. And the answer is yes. When we take a look at the seats object, the fact that the color has changed to red and the bucket field has been included suggests that both of these variables are references to the same object. We now take a look at a method which is related to object.freeze and this is the object.seal function. To demonstrate that, we head back to the source and remove these console.log messages. And this time, we will invoke object.seal on the mycar object. This will return the same mycar object but this time the fields will be sealed rather than frozen. So what exactly does that mean? Well, since we are running in strict mode, the effects are pretty much the same. For this reason, I won't go too much into depth on the seal method and won't even disable strict mode. So let us take a look at the kind of operation which is possible if you seal an object and strict mode is turned off. So for example, if you were to modify some of the existing fields within the object, such as the color of the car, this is perfectly fine with a sealed object. You can also modify the fields of the nested objects. However, since strict mode is turned on right now, if you were to head over to the browser and refresh, we get the same error that we did when we froze this object. You'll observe that if you disable strict mode, this error will not appear. However, let us quickly proceed to the kinds of operations which seal is meant to prevent. So I'm just going to comment out this line which is causing the error and we'll make sure that there is no issue when we refresh the page in the browser. Alright, so the output is now error free. Now if we were to go over to the code and then try to add new fields in the top level object, specifically if you were to add a weight attribute. This is something which seal does not permit. However, we can add new properties to nested objects. So adding a talk property to the nested engine is permitted. Just to test these out, we head over to the browser and when we refresh, we get an error on the line where we try to add the weight property to the car. So I'm just going to comment this out and heading over to the browser once more, this time the output has no errors. And we'll just quickly confirm that both his car and my car are in fact pointing to the same object. Much like object.freeze, the function simply returns the same object, which we will now confirm by heading over to the browser, of course. And now that both his car and my car are out in the console, I'll just expand the newly created variable. So in this case, the torque for the engine object has been added. 
the color of the seat has also been modified to white. And when we take a look at my car, we can see the exact same changes over here as well. Previously in this learning path, you have covered the use of arrays in JavaScript. And in this course, you have also taken a look at objects. We will now take a look at the map and reduce methods which are available in JavaScript, which are more applicable to arrays, but can be especially useful when working with an array of objects. So again, I have an HTML and JavaScript source for the demo. And heading over to the JavaScript, we start off by enabling strict mode and will then create an array of objects for us to work with. So imagine that you have a gathering at your place and you're about to cook a meal for your friends. So you head over to the nearby grocery store and you pick up a few items. These are the items listed in this array and they include some meat, some vegetables, a cake and also some drinks. Now all of the purchased items are represented as objects and your total purchase itself is represented by this array of objects. Given all of this, consider the problem where you wish to extract all of the prices in this array of objects. So you wish to create a new array containing just the price numbers and no objects. Well, there is one straightforward way to accomplish this. First, we initialize a prices array into which we will load all of the price numbers. So this is set to an empty array at first. Following that, we iterate over each of the objects in our items array and then we extract the price from it and then push it into the prices array. So when we do this and then print out this array of prices to the console, we can see exactly what we get by loading the page in the browser and this array of numbers has been printed out. So this is one way of accomplishing our task. We can head back to the source and see exactly what we have done here. We have iterated over each element of the items array and then added a new value to the prices array at each iteration. So we have effectively created a new array by performing some operations on the elements of an existing one. The lengths of the existing as well as the new arrays are identical. One way to think of it is that we are given an array with the elements x and then we want to define an operation f of x to define the contents of a new array. Well, to do exactly that, JavaScript provides a function known as map. This is a built-in function available for every array and the argument to this is a function. That function itself has an argument which is an element of the array. In this case, we reference each element as item and then within the function body, we define exactly what needs to be done with that item. In our example here, we simply return the price of the item. So for each element in our items array, we extract the value of the price field and this becomes an element in this price list array. The lengths of the items and the price list array will be exactly the same. Just to confirm, we will print out price list to the console and the output in the browser shows us that we have recreated the exact same array as we did previously using a for loop. So this is the purpose of the map method, where we effectively map each element of an existing array to an element of the newly created array. Heading back to our source code, we will redefine our map method, but this time we will use the new ES6 syntax for JavaScript. So this method definition is much more concise so when we call items.map, the argument to this is our map function, where the first value item represents the argument to the function. And then following the arrow, we can define the function body. In our case, there is no real body except for the fact that a single value is returned. So we can eliminate the curly braces and make use of the implicit return syntax. So functionally, this map method should do exactly the same operation as the previous one. And we can confirm this by heading over to the browser and then viewing the fact that 
the elements are exactly the same as the previous two runs. So it should now be clear that the map method allows us to create a brand new array out of each element of an existing one, where we effectively have a one-to-one -one mapping from the elements of the old array to the new one. However, what if our goal is not to have a one-to-one -one mapping, but instead we wanted to arrive at a single aggregate value out of the contents of an array? In the next video, we will see exactly how that can be accomplished using the reduce method of an array. It is now time for us to explore how we can perform an aggregate operation out of the contents in an array. Using our items array as an example, consider that we wanted the total price of all the items we have purchased. Well, one way to do this is to iterate over each of the items and then sum up the values of the price. Here we initialize a total variable to zero and then for each of the elements in our items array, we add in the value of price to it. And at the end, the total variable should contain the total price of all of our purchased items. So what exactly is this total? When we head over to the console, we get a nice round value of 100. So heading back to the source now, you may ask whether there is a more elegant way to define this aggregate operation than using a for loop as we have here. And the answer, sure enough, is yes. And we can do that by using the reduce method. This is where we define an aggregate operation which needs to be performed on the elements of an array. So we call items.reduce here. And within the argument, take a look at the syntax which we have employed. First, we define two different arguments to the reduce method. These are sum and item in our case, and sum here represents an accumulator. At each iteration, this is the value which will be updated by our logic. Also, the specific element at each iteration can be referenced by the second argument here, which is item. So in each iteration, we use item in order to update sum. And the logic used in order to perform this update is defined within the function body, which in our case is after the arrow. Here, we update the value of sum by incrementing it by item.price. The last argument here, which is zero, represents the initial value of our accumulator variable. So we start off with a price of zero. All right, so this method should calculate the total price of all of the items in our items array. And this should be captured in the variable total reducer. We will of course print out this value to the console and we should expect that this equals the same total we calculated previously, which was 100. And from the browser, we get that confirmation. So we now know how the reduce method can be used in order to reduce an array into a single value. The single value in this case is the total price of the purchased items. We will now explore one more array method, and this is the filter function. This is used to create a new array out of the elements of an existing one, except by applying a certain condition. So our items array contains a collection of objects, but we want a new array called expensive items, containing only those elements from the items array where the price is greater than $25. So this is the syntax which we use in order to apply such a filter on our items array. We invoke items.filter and the element at each iteration will be referenced as item. And then within the body of the filter function, we define the condition for the inclusion of the item element in the new array. In this case, if item.price is greater than or equal to $25, it becomes part of the expensive items array. And to confirm the contents of expensive items, we print it out to the console. And from the browser, we can see that it has been printed out. And upon expanding it, we see that the two expensive items, specifically the meat and drinks, are members of this array. So the contents of this new array are exactly of the same type 
as the contents of the original items array. That is, each of them are objects. Except that we have applied a filter in order to include only those elements which fulfill our condition. All right, we will now explore one more example of the reduce method where we apply this on our expensive items array. Here, we sum up the cost of all of the expensive items. So we invoke expensive items dot reduce and then use the same function body as we did previously. Then when we print out this cost expensive items, we should get a total price of the expensive items in our list. And from the console, we get that this total is equal to $63. So now that you know how to use the map, reduce and filter methods, you will be able to perform a whole host of array operations. And you can also see that this is especially useful when it comes to working with an array of objects. We will now move along and explore one more array operation. And this is one to get all of the unique values from an array, which contains a lot of duplicates. So the variable values here, is an array of numbers. And you can see here that there are many occurrences of the numbers three and four. Now, in order to extract all of the unique elements from this array, we can convert it to a set. So in this case, we create a set of values by creating a new set out of our values array. So while this will contain all of the unique elements in values, it will be in the form of a set and not an array. So in order to convert that into an array, we make use of the spread syntax, which can also be applied to a set. And we spread out the contents of the set within square brackets so that it becomes part of a unique values array. And we can confirm its contents by printing it out to the console. And when we view what is printed out, we can see that it contains the same elements within the original values array and in the same order, but all of the duplicates have been removed. Given that you now have a reasonable understanding of what exactly objects are in JavaScript, we will now explore the use of the instance of keyword in order to check whether an object is of a particular type. So once again, there is an HTML and JavaScript we will employ in the demo, but we head straight over to the JavaScript. Once strict mode has been enabled, I am going to define a new class representing a vehicle. So we can create new instances of vehicles using this class definition. And while doing so, we will need to provide the make, the model and the price for the vehicle to the constructor. Of course, we can create these new instances by making use of the new keyword. And this new vehicle, which is my car, is going to be a Volkswagen GTI, which cost $29,000. All right, let us now use this my car object, which has been created in order to generate one more object called your car. And this is going to be a deep copy of the my car object. So we effectively convert my car into a string using json.stringify and then use that string definition in order to create a new object by invoking json.parse. So your car is a deep copy of my car. And we now initialize one more object, her car. And we create this by using the spread syntax on my car. So the her car object will be a new object containing all of the fields in my car. Next. We create a fourth object called his car by invoking object.create on my car. We have seen that this has the effect of using my car as a prototype for the new object. We will apply the instance of operator on each of these objects to check whether each of them is an instance of the vehicle class. First though, we will check whether my car is an instance of vehicle and note the specific syntax here. We have the object variable followed by the instance of keyword followed by the specific type. So is my car an instance of vehicle? Well, we pull up the browser and load the HTML page and the console gives us the answer of yes. 
So the MyCar object is an instance of vehicle, but does this apply to deep copies of my car? So now we apply the instance of operator on your car. And from the browser, we see that this is not an instance of vehicle. So even though all of the fields of the my car object were copied over to your car, the conversion of the original object to a string and then recreation of an object from that has clearly not retained the information about the class from which the original object was built. Heading back to the source, we will now apply instance of on the her car object, which was created by applying the spread syntax on my car. So the question is, does her car only contain the fields of my car, but does it also contain information with regards to the original class from which it was created? Well, the answer is the latter. So while her car does contain all of the fields as my car, it is not of the same type. Moving over now to the last of the objects which we created, where we now check whether creating an object using object.create retains information about the original type. So this is where the my car object is a prototype of his car. But does it mean that it is an instance of vehicle? Well, from the browser, we see that the answer is yes. To get an idea of why this is the case, we can head back to the source. And now we will apply the type of operator on each of these four objects. So what exactly are their types? Well, from the console, we can see that each and every one of them is in fact an object. So what exactly is meant by instance of? Well, to get a clearer idea of that, I'm once again heading back to the source and we can just comment out all of these console.log messages and we will just print out each of the objects in their entirety to the console. And this time when we refresh, let us go ahead and examine each of these in detail, starting with my car. And right here, we can see that it is of type vehicle. So all of the fields for the vehicle can be seen here. But now we can minimize this vehicle and then heading over to the your car object. We observe that it contains the same fields as my car, but there is no reference to the vehicle class here. Moving over from your car over to the her car object, we see that the same applies to this one as well. There is no reference here to the vehicle class. This is not the case with his car, however, where once again, just like my car, we can see that this references the vehicle class itself. And this is also evident within the proto field. Once we expand that, all of the fields for the vehicle are visible. So if you have applied inheritance in other programming languages, it is important for you to know that to achieve the same end in JavaScript, you need to employ prototypes. And one way to create a new object by using an existing one for a prototype is by invoking the object.create method. So in this case, his car has inherited all of the properties from my car, and this has happened under the hood. It is now time for us to explore how we can explicitly define inheritance in JavaScript by defining a class which extends an existing one. So we head back to the source for this, and we will now comment out these console.log messages as well before defining a new class which represents a motorcycle which is a type of vehicle. And in order for this motorcycle to be a subclass of vehicle, we can make use of the extends keyword followed by the name of the vehicle class. This means that the motorcycle class will inherit all of the fields and functions defined within vehicle. And we have the option of adding new elements of our own or even overriding the definitions from the parent in the motorcycle class. So when a new motorcycle object is created, what do we want it to contain? Well, we want to use all of the fields defined within the vehicle class, such as the make, model, and price. And in addition to that, we also want a motorcycle to have the height of the seat specified. For this reason, all four of these fields are inputs to the motorcycle's constructor. Now, we already have a constructor function which assigns 
the make, model, and price fields to the object. And this was defined within the vehicle class. And we can invoke that constructor by calling the super method from this child class. From other programming languages, some of you may know that super is a reference to the constructor of the super class. And in our case, the super class constructor takes in three arguments, which corresponds to the three arguments we pass along when we invoke super. So that will attach the make, model, and price to the motorcycle object. And then beyond that, we also assign the seat height to that object. So let us go ahead and then create a new instance of motorcycle. This is going to represent a Ducati monster. And we just pass along three arguments representing the make, model, and price, and then leave out the seat height for now. Following that, we will check whether my bike is an instance of motorcycle and whether it is also an instance of vehicle. And the answer in each case is yes. So by making use of the extends keyword in order to define a subclass, we have effectively implemented inheritance in JavaScript. Moving along now, let us see what happens if we happen to define the blueprint for an object by defining a function constructor rather than a class. We have covered the fact previously that the class keyword in JavaScript is merely a syntactical construct and that under the hood, it is in fact prototypes and function constructors which are implemented. So now that we have the blueprint for a city object using this function constructor, we can initialize a new instance of city, which represents the city of Bangalore. And then following that, we invoke the instance of operator on my city. And from the console, we see that this is in fact an instance of city. So function constructors as well as classes are pretty much the same from the point of view of the instance of operator. This course will have given you a firm foundation in the creation and use of JavaScript objects. We started off by looking at what JavaScript objects are at a fundamental level, essentially a collection of key and value pairs where the values can be functions as well as other objects. We took a look at the this keyword within JavaScript objects and how we can apply the call method to link a function to a specific object instance. We then delved into the use of object constructors, which essentially serve as templates out of which new objects can be created. Finally, we use the array methods of map, reduce, and filter in order to work with an array of objects. Having done all the labs in this course, you will have a lot of familiarity with the different JavaScript types, including objects. You will be in a position to move on to more advanced topics in the language, especially with regards to functions, which are covered in the course, advanced function operations in JavaScript.